Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 99 of the Stephen King podcast. And it's great to be back again. If you remember from our last podcast, which was a look back at 2018, I had mentioned uh, back in January that I would be out for a month roughly with because I was having knee replacement surgery. Happy to report that that surgery went well. It is now March the 3rd, a Sunday, and I am back. And I have to say, that for me, and I, I assume for a lot of people this year, it's been a pretty rough winter. In Edmonton, we experienced our coldest February in the last 40 years. That's right, four zero years. And how cold was it? The mean temperature was between minus 19.2 Celsius and minus 19.5. And that puts us at the fifth lowest coldest February in the past 139 years. And as I'm recording this podcast, I can see on the weather report that across all of the U.S. from the West East Coast, there's a major storm ripping its way across the, the entire nation and causing lots of problems all over there. So certainly my hibernation, I guess you could say, of February was most welcome. But I, I know for a lot of you, it's been a tough winter as well. So it's time to get back into some uh, Stephen King news, and hopefully that will warm everyone up a little bit. And I got to say, I thought February would be a quiet month for Stephen King news, but I've gone through all my Stephen King alerts and I've pulled off over 30 plus news items that I want to go through. And needless to say, this won't be an exhaustive list, but or I won't talk exhaustively about each item, but I just want to bring each one of these items to your attention. And I think because of the number of news items, I'm going to hold off on the look ahead at specific things for what I'm excited about until next episode, which will be by the way, episode 100. And I'm hoping to get some guests on that. And we'll see if I can, I'll confirm that uh, later on. But uh, at the moment, that's up in the air. And uh, so we're, we're just going to walk through all these news items. And the other thing I wanted to mention before I get into them is that now that I'm back, I hope to be putting out episodes on a more regular basis. There's a ton of stuff happening again and another book coming out this year, so which is part of the news, which is great. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to podcasting all the way through 2019 and I hope you guys will join me in, in this journey through the upcoming year. So let's get into it and uh, we'll start with the news. Welcome, welcome. Do not fear the door that lies before you. We will protect you. We are your guides, Hans and Lou, and we will give you the latest in Stephen King news. But before we do so, you must prove yourself worthy. You must open the door and join us in the death room. All right. This is late breaking and actually happened in late 2018, but just in case you weren't aware of it, Sleepwalkers got a collector's edition Blu-ray from Shout Factory and it's a two disc set. And even though the actual movie release is the same transfer that was from the one released for the 2012 Blu-ray, that's not necessarily a bad thing because apparently that presentation was quite excellent. And the bit rate is slightly higher on that, which means that there's uh, you know a slight increase in quality. It has two auto tracks, uh, English 5.1 and uh, a, a two track DTS HD track. But of course, the biggest draw for this will be the extra disc, which will be audio commentary with Mick Garris, Brian Krause, and Match and Amick. There's a feature Feline Trouble, a 19 interview minute interview with Mick Garris. When Charles Met Tanya, conversation between Brian Krause and Madchen Amick, Mother and More, a 16-minute interview with actress Ellis Kriege, who, of course, we all know from the adaptation of Peter Straub's Ghost Story, and more recently, the Borg Queen in Star Trek First Contact. There's another feature, Creatures and Cats, the FX of Stephen King's Sleepwalkers, which is a 
minute interview with special makeup effects supervisor Tony Gardner and prosthetics design and sculptor Mike Smithson. They also talk about the film's original ending, some of which is shown during the behind scenes footage, which is cool. There's an additional seven minutes of you know, behind the scenes footage. You get the usual uh, theatrical trailer, TV spots, uh, still gallery. And once again, unfortunately, Stephen King's input on on this film is not present, which is understandable, but it's always a bit of a disappointment when he, the creators of these extra content are not able to get him. But just wanted to point that out in case that slipped under your radar. That disc was available on November 6th, 2018, and you can buy it uh, on Amazon or uh, wherever you normally get your, your movies. So that's item one. Let's see what item two, item two, still on the home video release front. And I should mention that these are, usually I do them by categories, but because there's so many of them, I'm just going to go through them chronologically this time. And this one is actually for 20, 2019, and it's the original Pet Cemetery, which I believe we've mentioned in earlier podcasts, is going to get a 4K Ultra HD, a new Blu-ray for the 30th anniversary. Wow, it's hard to believe that it's been 30 years, 1989, since the original Pet Cemetery from director Mary Lambert arrived in theaters. We're going to get a 30th anniversary edition of this movie from Paramount Home Entertainment. And a 4K re release is also something uh, that very few Stephen King moves have gotten, so that's something to uh, applaud. Bonus features on this edition will include a commentary by the director, Mary Lambert, special entitled Stephen King character, another one on the characters, and another one on filming the horror. And if you check out a link at on Amazon or wherever, you're going to see the cover art for this, and it's pretty cool. It's 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 a nice colored cover with the Pet Cemetery logo and church is prominent on it. And uh, of course, we've got the cemetery, and I don't want to spoil everything on there, but I really love the color scheme on this one, and that this cover really pops. So this looks uh, really good. And this will be available, I believe, on March 26th. That's right, March 26th, just around the time that the new adaptation of Pet Cemetery is going to hit the theater. So for you uh, home theater enthusiasts, keep your, uh, you want to mark, want to mark this down on your calendar. Okay, more, more home video news. Castle Rock, the complete first season, hit the streets on January 8th. And this is also available in 4K, Ultra HD, and Blu-ray and digital. So that's pretty cool. And despite the fact that I wasn't a big fan of the overall arc of the season, it's nice to see the Stephen King material getting this type of treatment. And I'm just going through here. You can see if there's any bonus features, which there are. And there's a Blood on the New Page featurette, a Clockwork of Horror, merging the styles of Stephen King and J.J. Abrams. And then that for each episode, there's a behind the scenes feature attached to it as well. So, and uh, my understanding is these special features inside the episodes, featurettes were also aired on Hulu. So it's kind of nice to have these chronicled uh, uh, and archived on the DVD set as well. Each one is about two to three minutes long, so it's not a lot, but it does give a little bit of extra insight into the behind the scenes of the series. And in keeping with Castle Rock news, uh, season two of Castle Rock will be heading into production in March. So that will be interesting to see. Uh, it's returning to central Massachusetts to film new episodes for Hulu. Going to be curious as to what the storyline is going to be. The co-creator says that each season can be its own self-contained mystery. Part of my issue with the first season is that I don't think it answered all the questions to that mystery. So we'll have to see how they approach it this time and which aspects of the Stephen King universe or multiverse they're going to focus on in season two. So we'll keep an eye on that and provide our further updates as we find out more information about what's going on with season two of Castle Rock. In appearances news, Stephen King and other top authors are heading to Minneapolis for a new book festival. And this book festival is taking place in downtown Minneapolis on May 11th and 12th. And it's going to be at multiple venues. So you'll have to, if you're planning to attend, you'll have to drill down and find out exactly where Stephen King is going to be. But it looks like he's going to revive the Rock Bond of Reminders with, they're going to play a concert at First Avenue with Amy Tan, Mary Carr, 
humorist Dave Barry and sports writer Mitch Album. And I don't know if there's going to be more players than that. And it should be a lot of fun. Don't know if King is doing a specific talk after that, but he's definitely going to be there for he's definitely going to be there for an appearance with the Rock Band of Miners, which I don't think they've appeared together uh, in any manner for quite a while. So that should be a lot of fun. So yeah, people in that area, Minneapolis uh, area, Stephen King's coming into your town, and it's well worth checking him out. So keep that mark that one down on your calendar. And on TV news. Creep Show, the TV series, is adapting Stephen King's most disturbing story, and that would be Survivor Type, and that <laughs> that will be that will be a hell of a role for whatever actor they cast to play that part, and it will be also a makeup artist dream. And Greg Nicotero is currently working on the Creep Show TV series for Shutter, which is a a streaming service, a horror streaming service. Uh, And the Creep Show is going to be one of the additions to their portfolio of horror offerings that they're going to be providing to their customers. So that should be very, very interesting. (laughs) Trying to just, uh, you know, I'm just imagining that story in my head. That should be quite the uh, tour de force for the actor and the makeup artist that are going to be involved in bringing that story to life. So check that one out when it comes and we definitely will keep uh, everybody posted when that one's available. Okay. Then in January, still, we got the second Pet Cemetery Dead is Better trailer. And this one really, I think, opened up uh, a can of worms for people that are familiar with the story and I'm not going to go into details here. If you haven't checked out that trailer, if you don't want to be spoiled, then you definitely don't want to check out that trailer. But we'll be ta- I'll talk about this one in way more depth uh, when I do the next podcast, uh, look, look ahead at uh, 2019. I just have to say that I'm excited by what I saw, and I'm also very happy to have confirmed that we are not going to be getting a carbon copy of the first Pet Cemetery adaptation. So... I think it's a win-win for everybody involved, and I'm really looking forward to discussing this in further detail in the next episode of the Stephen King Podcast, which we will have a a big spoiler warning when we discuss this topic. But if you're curious, you can find that new trailer out on the interweb on YouTube and so forth. So be be forewarned, though, it gives away quite a bit, even though I think we still have a lot more surprises in store as to what's going to happen in the last third of the movie now, based on what uh, they're showing in the trailer. So exciting. Very, very exciting. On other streaming services... Josh Boone, who's been talking about The Stand, it seems like, for a couple of years now, has finally gotten most of his X-Men Mew Mutants duties behind him and is going to be doing The Stand at for CBS on their all-access all streaming service, of which they currently have Star Trek uh, Discovery being uh, broadcast from. So uh, they've given him a 10-episode order. And it's hailed as a limited event, so we will have to see what will be in store for the stand. I know there's been some misgivings about it landing at CBS. People are worried that it's not going to be able to be as graphic or present things of a restricted nature since it's on a streaming service. Um, I believe I have another article about this later on, but that's an understandable concern. And also the other thing is because it's on TV, concerned that we won't be getting like top-notch movie actors. It'll be relegated to TV actors. But, you know, there's so many good actors out there right now. I don't really see this as a big issue, but We'll, we'll have to see. Uh, be interesting once we start. To, we'll have a better idea, of course, once they start announcing their casting decisions. Other thing to note here is that Stephen King and his son Owen King are both partnered on this project or working on this project. So we'll have to see exactly how that plays out in later news releases. But good to know that there's the King influences there on the stand project. And 10 episodes, if they're an hour each, 10 hours, is, is that going to be enough to tell a stand story properly? We'll have to see. But based on the money that they're spending on Star Trek Discovery, which I believe is the most expensive television show on TV right now, hoping that they're going to provide the same resources, I guess you could say, to the stand as well. And I don't think it even needs to be at the same level of expense that Star Trek Discovery is being made at, but definitely don't want them to cheap out on this. So uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed that Josh Boone will finally get 
the stand done in a form that will make everybody happy. And then on January 31st, over at Lilia's library, you can see that Hans broke the news that uh, via stephenking.com, Stephen King's next book was announced. And that book is called The Institute, which for any constant reader makes the brain connection to the shop from the fire starter. And especially when you start reading the synopsis for the book and from the book flap in the middle of the night in a house on a quiet street in suburban Minneapolis, intruders silently murder Luke Ellis's parents and load him into a black SUV. The operation takes less than two minutes. Luke will wake up at the Institute in a room that looks just like his own, except there's no window. And outside his door are other doors, behind which are other kids with special talents, telekinesis and telepathy, who got to this place the same way Luke did. Kalisha, Nick, George, Iris, and 10-year-old Avery Dixon, they are all in front half. Others, Luke learns, graduated to back half. Like the Roach Motel, Kalisha says, you can check in, but you don't check out. In this most sinister of institutions, the director, Mrs. Sigsby, and her staff are ruthlessly dedicated to extracting from these children the force of their extra normal gifts. There are no scruples here. If you go along, you get tokens from the vending machines. If you don't, punishment is brutal. As each new victim disappears to back half, Luke becomes more and more desperate to get out and get help, but no one has ever escaped from the Institute. As psychically terrifying as Firestarter, and with the spectacular kid power of it, the Institute is Stephen King's gut-wrenchingly dramatic story of good versus evil in a world where the good guys don't always win. Well, that really brings back memories of Firestarter and a lot of the sequels of Firestarter where they had to deal with the shop. It's great to see King doing something pretty well brand new and getting back into the horror, his horror roots again. So really looking forward to this. Of course, this is going to be the highlight of 2019 as anytime there's a, a new Stephen King book to read. And the good news about this is the release date for the first edition is September 10th, 2019. So mark that down, folks. It's Stephen King's next book is The Institute. And also on January 31st, uh, again at Lilia's Library, Lilia noted that uh, Joe Hill will be releasing a new short story collection entitled Full Throttle in the fall, October 29th. The book will be 384 pages long and it'll feature 11 short stories. Some of them are new, and some of them have been previously published elsewhere. It will also include Hill's two collaborations with his father, Stephen King, Full Throttle and In the Tall Grass. And we all already know that In the Tall Grass has been filmed and will probably premiere later this year. While Full Throttle was reported as beginning a big screen treatment, but nothing else has surfaced about that since it was first reported. And based on Joe Hill's story in Fright or Flight, and his previous short story collection, 20th Century Ghosts. I'm really looking forward to this. He's he's really on the top of his game right now. And any new stuff from the King clan is always something to look forward to. So another date to mark down, October 29th, Joe Hill's short story collection, Full Throttle. If you want to swing in back to Stephen King's next novel uh, over at Entertainment Weekly on, I'm trying to find the date here, there's a... It looks like this was out in f late uh, January or maybe early February. I'm sure if you search EW, you'll find it easy enough. Oh, there it is, February 1st. There's a, a recap of the synopsis as well as an excerpt of the book. And to cap it all off, there's a look at the cover. It shows the, a boy inside a, a train, which looks like his room inside the train car and the, the train car says Southway Express. So it looks like this this is a moving operation. So check out that cover. It's pretty intriguing. This I assume this is the American cover. There's also a excerpt there and it gives you a sense of the some of the characters in the books, which is pretty cool. So Entertainment Weekly, February 1st, check it out. Anthony Bresnikin, once again, championing another Stephen King article. On March 1st, Then a Geek published an article about It Chapter 2. They talked about the cast. We know that the following players have been cast. Jessica Chastain is playing Beverly Marsh. James McAvoy is Bill Denbro. Bill Hader plays Richie Tozier. Jay Ryan will play Ben Hanscombe. James Ransone will play Eddie Kasprick. Andy Bean will play Stan Uris. Xavier Dolan will play Adrian Mellon. We also have Will Benbrink will play Tom Rogan, who is the abusive husband of the now adult Beverly. Teach Grant 
will be Henry Bowers, the adult version that was played by Nicholas Hamilton in the first movie. So Henry survived his tumble down that well. That'll be interesting to see how messed up that made him. And Taylor Frey will play Dan Haggerty, who is in a relationship with Adrian Mellon. So that tells us also that the release date for Chapter 2 of It will arrive in theater September 6th. Two big events in September, Stephen King's new book and It Part 2, which are Chapter 2, as they're calling it. And this, ver this chapter will, of course, take place 27 years after the events of the first movie. Also, the article also has a link to some of the some of the footage that was shown at uh, San Diego Go Comic Con, and we got a glimpse of the Losers Clubs as the, as the adults. And in it, see some clips of the adult cast first table read. We also get the sequence where the adults first get together in the Chinese restaurant, the first time they've reunited since 1989. We get to see Bill Hader as Richie Tozier greeting everybody with his in inimitable mouth running style. In movie news, kind of forgotten in all this other exciting news that's going on in Stephen King, we of course have Dr. Sleep that was initially set to be released on January 24th, but now it has been pushed forward to November 8th, 2019. So it's coming out this year. So that makes three big Stephen King movies in the movie theaters this year. Pet Cemetery, of course, then It Chapter 2 or Volume 2, and then Dr. Sleep. And we'll talk about this in the next podcast, in the 2019 Looking Ahead podcast. But initially, obviously, it has got the the highest profile. It's going to be really hard to decide to how to rate these three movies in terms of anticipation based on the things that we've that I know about them from behind the scenes, be it on directions taken or the people behind the cameras in front of the cameras. So that should be for that'll make for an interesting conversation. But three Stephen King movies in 2019. Wow. That's unbelievable. <laughs> the, the King the King Nassance continues in 2019. The year of 19, of course. It just has to it, it it just makes sense, doesn't it? And on February 2nd over at Lilia's Library, if you want to see the creative team behind the stand, again, going back to that with Josh Boone, there's a picture of the writer's room, and in it we can see Josh Boone, Ben Cavell, Owen King, Jill Killington, Nate Lee, and Eric Dickinson in the stands writer room. So we can see that Owen King is very actively involved in the creation of the series, which is very interesting. And I hope to hear from interviews coming in the future as to exactly how and why it came for Owen King to be so deeply involved in this this series. And that, that should be very fascinating. So looking forward to that. But at least they're working on it. So that's good to hear. Now we have an unconfirmed report from thathashtagshow.com on February 7th that Amazon Studios is set to move ahead with the production on their adaptation of Stephen King's The Dark Tower books and that the series will be comprised of 13 one-hour episodes produced by Glenn Mazzara and Akiva Goldsman and Stephen King. I haven't been able to confirm this report anywhere else, so you take this one with a grain of salt. The plan is to assemble the cast ahead of a mid-April start in Croatia, where it's expected to film until late June. Part of the delay may be to provide some distance between the TV series and the movie. 2017 film adaptation and it looks like they're going to go with the story from Wizard and Glass in that it will focus on Roland as a young boy from a long line of gunslingers and his quartet comprised of Cuthbert Algood, Ellen Johns, Eileen Ritter and Jamie DeCurry in addition to his girlfriend Susan Delgado and it's looking for actors and actresses aged 16 to 18 for all the roles listed. So Flag will show up as Martin Broadcloak and Roland's mother, Gabrielle, will factor into the plot, as well as King's, or King's, <laughs> as Roland's father, Stephen, will also be part of, the, part of this series as well. So it looks like they're pulling out pieces of uh, Wizard and Glass to film this. And hopefully, I hope that they also incorporate some of the younger Roland uh, material that's in the, the Gunslinger as well. And that it looks like they're going to approach this series chronologically. So we'll have to keep our fingers crossed that this is true. Uh, again, I caution that everyone treat this one with a big grain of salt because I haven't been able to find any other corroborating articles about this. And we've been hearing this 
reports of this type from various sites, but uh, nothing official has been announced by Amazon or King. So not going to get too excited until that happens. But it's just good to know that there somebody is out there is willing to take a chance on the Dark Tower after the mixed reception at best that the 2017 movie got. In film news still, again, Pet Cemetery is going to close the South by Southwest 2019 Film Festival. And what's interesting about that is that the opening movie is, I believe it's going to be Jordan Peele's Us, will open the festival, which is a nice mix for a nice horror bookend for the festival with Us and Pet Cemetery opening and closing the the South by Southwest Festival starts Friday, March 8th and ends Sunday, March 17th. So there we go. March 17th, we'll get the first public screening of Pet Cemetery, And it'll be interesting to see what kind of feedback comes out of that. I'll definitely be keeping my eyes and ears posted to initial reactions to the screening of Pet Cemetery. In continuing adaptation news, on February 8th, it was announced that Mile 81 is going to be heading to the screen with 1922 producer Campfire and director Alistair Legrand. And assume, because that was a a Netflix production, that this is where we're going to find, uh, or this is where this adaptation of Mile 81 is going to land. So uh, not really any too many details, but other than that, production is planned to start in fall of 2019, which would make me guess that if we're going not going to see this until 2020 and in very early stages, there's always the possibility that it might not happen. But this is being reported by Deadline Hollywood, so it's it's pretty solid that this is going to take place. But we won't be seeing anything about this until next year. Mile 81, going to be adapted. Then we have some more. There's an interview. We've got this covered. Dr. Sleep actress teases the story of the Shining sequel and Emily Allen Lind, who's playing Snakebite Andy, who's part of the True Knot and feeds off of the shining powers of anybody that has such a power. And she gives a little bit of insight into what the movie's about. She's saying that it picks up from where Danny, played by Hugh McGregor, is going down the wrong path, a lot like his dad, who's played by Jack Nicholson in the original movie. He decides when he's younger right after the Overlook Hotel has been destroyed, that he's going to turn off his powers. A couple of decades later, and Danny meets a young girl who has similar abilities to him, played by Kylie Curran, and she's playing Aberstone from the book. And she reaches out to him, and he hasn't had his powers, his shining, on for for 20-something years since he was a little boy. And this little girl, Aberstone, reaches out to him somehow and needs his help because she has the most powerful shining out of everyone in the world. And then Lynn said... This is where her character, Snake Bike Andy, comes into the story. She's saying that Aberstone is reaching out to Danny to try and, and help her because this cult called the True Knot, which I'm a part of, is trying to capture her because what they do is kill children and eat the shining out of them. And that makes them almost immortal. So they're trying to find her because if they eat her, they will be set for years and years and years and be very healthy. It's sort of like the movie is really cool because you have two different storylines going on. You see the whole Abra Danny storyline and the True Knot storyline, and they're kind of coming together until the end when they merge into one. This sounds pretty exciting, and we've seen what mastery we've Mike Flanagan displayed with not just Gerald's Game, which was adapted for Netflix last year, but his adaptation of The Haunting of Hill House, where he merged past and future storylines of seven characters, the the the, fam, the Crane family. And uh, I'm just in awe of what he did with that. And I'm really looking forward to what he's going to be doing with this. So this sounds really exciting. And as I mentioned earlier, this has been moved up till November, to November 8th. So that is going to be something really exciting. And it's going to be curious to see how he, and by he, I mean Flanagan, incorporates the book version of what happened in The Shining versus the more famous Kubrick version. So that also is something to look forward to. And that's going to be, I'm sure, something that Flanagan will handle very adroitly. And then a follow-up on February 9th over at Pop Culture Media or popculture.streaming or Pop Culture Media, sorry. Um, There was, uh, as I mentioned when I announced this previously about The Stand being on CBS, Josh Boone wants to let everyone know that 
the stand on CBS All Access will be handled as a R-rated HBO level type of show, which on an all streaming service, you can set the what standard you want. So it's great to hear that that concern will be addressed while fans, for fans that were worried about it being a little bit neutered because it was being done on CBS as opposed to HBO or AMC or something like that. Then we have on February 11th over at Collider, uh, interview with Jason Clark on Pet Cemetery. And he talks about his favorite book moments from Pet Cemetery that didn't make the cut. So you'll have to read the article. I'm not going to give away all of that, but it's a pretty good article. And Jason Clark goes into various things that he liked in the book that didn't make it and his general impressions of working with Jonathan Lithgow and things of that nature. So it's a nice little behind the scenes look at an actor's thoughts on working on a horror movie, especially one as famous as the Stephen King one and the legacy that they have to face because of what was accomplished with the first adaptation of the Pet Cemetery book. So check that one out on February 11th at Collider. As we move closer through the year, on Valentine's Day, we found out that It Chapter 2 had a rough cut screening, and it's roughly over three hours long, which is not unusual for a first cut. I imagine by the time they lock this this one down for release, I think it would probably, if it goes over two and a half hours, it might push two hours, 40 minutes. I think that would be the tops. General reaction is that it's pretty good. I'm not as good as the first one. And again, this is all anecdotal feedback. So don't, again, take it with a grain of salt. I'm curious to see how Machete is going to handle the second half because I think it's generally generally agreed upon that the adult half of the story is not as scary as the children half of the story. But with all these actors that they've got here, uh, hopefully they will be able to give us a movie that is close to, if not better than the first one. But we'll see. It's uh, he's definitely it's definitely going to be a challenge for Machete to create something that was as well received as the first one. And it's interesting because I didn't find the first movie scary. Uh, it was more of a thriller than a than a scary movie. So I'm hoping that the this one will be a little more intense actually than the first one. So we'll have to see how it plays out. The Outsider, Stephen King's last book, is going to be a 10-episode series on HBO, and they have their director. It's Andrew Bernstein, who did Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan, and he will not only direct several episodes, but he will also be an executive producer on the series with Ben Mendelsohn set to star and produce. So that should be a lot of fun. And it's I'm assuming at this point that they're going to be casting another Holly. So it'll be interesting that we'll have the Mr. Mercedes Holly and the Outsider Holly. But I would really like it if they could cast the same actor for for this role, just to give a little continuity between those two uh, properties. But we'll have to see how that plays out. On February 18th, Cujo is getting a special Blu-ray release. And this one is being done by Eureka Classics. And it's going to be out on April 29th, 2019. And Again, the artwork for this, uh, it looks like there's two versions. There might be a, yes, there's a limited edition hardbound slipcase and a limited edition collector's booklet and bonus Blu-ray disc. So there's going to be two versions, just a straight uh, Blu-ray release and then this uh, limited edition, which has got a wonderful artwork. Check it out on Hollywood News uh, on February 18th. You can see the artwork there and that looks pretty fantastic. The limited edition will only have 4,000 units and it will include a reversible sleeve featuring artwork by Justin Osborne, plus a limited edition 60-page collector's booklet featuring a new writing on the film by Lee Gamblin, author Scott Harrison, and Craig Ian Mann, and include archival imagery from the film's production. There will be uh, new interviews, some of them fairly long. Dee Wallace, 40 minutes. Uh, Burns, Charles Bernstein, composer, 35 minutes. Stuntman Gary Morgan, 25 minutes. Stuntwoman Jean Coulter, 21 minutes. Casting director Marsha Ross, 20 minutes. Visual effects artist Kathy Lawrence, 13 minutes. Special effects designer Robert Clark, 12 minutes. Dog trainer interview Teresa Miller, 28 minutes. And then Dog Days, the making of Cujo, archival documentary on the film. It's production. And the limited edition will also have a second disc with a Q&A with D. Wallace from Cineman Maniacs and Monster Fest 2015, moderated by Lee Gammon, and a new interview with critic and author Kim Newman. So you want to mark that down, April 29th, 2019. And then on February 18th, Castle Rock takes home WGA Awards. So Writers Guild of America gave the first season of Castle Rock 
the trophy for the best original long form series. Wow, congratulations to them. I'm a little surprised, to be honest. Again, I found the first season a little uh, more than a little unsatisfactory, but there were a couple of good episodes, so it's a, a, another impressive win for something related to Stephen King. And then uh, on February 20th, Mr. Mercedes season three casting. And this casting blows my wild ass theory out of the water. I thought they might be doing the second half or the unfilmed part of End of Watch, which got into the more crazy aspects of the video game mind hopping storyline that they downplayed pretty much in season two of Mr. Mercedes. So it looks like they're going back to actually do the second book, which is uh, interesting. And they're going to be covering Finders Keepers, which is great because I really enjoyed that that book quite a bit. And in related news to that, I'm going to jump ahead to that story. Did I throw it out? I thought I had it here. We also know that Bruce Dern has been cast as, will play John Rothstein. And he's the reclusive writer from Finders Keepers. So that's pretty cool. And I don't know if there's enough story there for the whole, to fill the whole season, the whole third season. So I'm still holding out hope maybe that they're going to do part of End of Watch, but we'll have to see. But yeah, casting announcements for Mr. Mercedes 3, Gabriel Ebert, Ricky and the Flash, and Romarian Newton Rise are set as series regulars. And Glenn Turman, How to Get Away with Murder, will, re- will recur on the upcoming Thursday season of A&T's audience that's network's critically praised drama series Mr. Mercedes and production is already underway in Charleston, Carolina. Ebert will play Morris Bell and me who you are uh, if you've read Finders Keepers you know what he's all about. Newton will play Peter Sobers. Again, we all know what he's about. And True Terman will play Judge Bernard Rains, the no-nonsense judge presiding over Lou Linkletter's murder trial. So that's interesting. So we're going to be carrying elements from both books in this season, it looks like. So we'll uh, we'll have to see how that all plays out. That could be, it could make for an interesting mix for sure. Over at Lydia's library, he mentions that on February 21st, you can hear Stephen King's interview with Eli Roth. Last year, AMC aired uh, History of Horror in Seven Parts, which featured interviews with many of the top names in horror. But in particular, they've decided to do an uncut podcast, and there will be 12 hours or 12 episodes and the, with hours of never heard before conversations between Roth, Stephen King, Edgar Wright, Quentin Tarantino, Diablo Cody, Brian Fuller, Catherine Hardwick, Victor Laval. Tippi Hendren, Bruce Campbell, Josh Harnett, Greg Nicotero, and Rob Zombie. These episodes from the podcast will be available on Shudder on Friday, May 22nd, exclusively for its, February 22nd, sorry, exclusively for its members. Episode 1 features Ross Complete Conversation with Stephen King, and that will be available to on the same day to non-members on Apple Podcasts and other platforms. So check that out, and that was a pretty good series. I, I, I highly recommend everybody track that down if they can. It'll be cool to uh, get this extra material to listen to, so check that out. It, another It article, but this time it's going back to the original 1990 miniseries and the story of it documentary reunites cast and crew of the 99 miniseries featuring Tim Curry, Richard Thomas, Seth Green, Emily Perkins, Tim Reed, and many more. And this is being spearheaded by John Campiopano, who if you remember, did a fantastic job with the Pet Cemetery documentary. And in this particular case, he's going to be talking to many of the cast and crew members for his it documentary so you can check that out on february 22nd over at consequence of sound they have this article and they also have a link to the pennywise the story of it uh, trailer that you can watch so check that out second last article and this just dropped on march 1st if you remember last year we reported or is it back in 2017 i can't remember now there was a lawsuit filed against Stephen King claiming that his Dark Tower books rip off another series of, but this was a time uh, time traveling comic book series called The Rook uh, in which a, a cowboy or the hero of the, of the series used a time machine to travel back and forth and the lawsuit claimed that Stephen King's Dark Tower was plagiarized that series. But on March 1st, the judge tossed the copyright suit 
which I don't think any of us believe really had much of a chance to begin with. So that closes that story. And all I can say for that is good riddance. And finally, just got this today. And Jessica Chastain, who is playing the adult Beverly in It, said that chapter two has the bloodiest sequence ever in horror films. And you can go on YouTube and look for uh, her appearance on the Jimmy Kimmel show and our Jimmy Fallon show on the Tonight Show, sorry. And you can find out, you can watch her talking about this and it'll be interesting to see exactly where this is. Is this in the Chinese restaurant? We'll have to find out. But uh, the Chinese restaurant scene, I'm not sure. (laughs) That brings us to the last news article that I got for the time period that I was out recuperating for from my knee surgery. That's like over 30 plus articles just a ton of Stephen King news. I'm going to call this on this podcast. We're going to, I'm going to save my look ahead to 2019 to the things that have got excite me most. It's really, it's the four things, Stephen King's book, the Pet Cemetery movie, the second It movie and the Dr. Sleep movie. So I'd like to, I don't want to rush through those and I, I'm, I want to get a, a water cooler conversation going on those particular items. So I'm going to leave those till episode 100. Going to try to get a couple of guests on and make it a party. All right. So thank you all for bearing with me as I recuperated. And I'm sure you're all busy trying to keep warm anyhow over the <laughs> over the month of February. It was just brutal for for many of us. And it's been a tough winter, man. You know, you've seen the news of the hurricanes and the fires in California and whatnot and snowstorms on the East Coast, the deep chill that we've had out here. It's been it's been a one heck of a winter and uh, it's always good to have pursuits that keep your mind away from such things. And I'm really amazed at the amount of Stephen King related material that's come out over the past couple of years. It's just been crazy, but it's also been fantastic. And like I'm sure all of you out there, I'm really excited to see what we're going to be getting in the, not just this year, but in 2020. And when is it going to slow down? Hopefully for not for a long time. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this catch-up episode, and we'll be talking to you hopefully in a couple of weeks. So, as always, stay safe, but stay scared. The end. Bool.